in our class this morning in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this time. We're thankful, Father, for our day. Thankful for the opportunity we have this morning. Thankful for the fact that every Sunday morning we know that we will meet for Bible class and that we will worship. We pray, Father, we will always remember that every seven days, every Sunday, this opportunity would exist before us. We pray, Father, that we will train ourselves that this will not become routine, it will not become mundane, that it will not just be something that we have to do, but we pray, Father, we will, we will recognize that spending our time in a study of your word and devoting ourselves to a period of worship and bowing down before you as the almighty God of this entire world, this entire universe, everything that we know, we pray, Father, we'll recognize the wonderful opportunity it truly is to be here. We pray, Father, a very special prayer on those that we know. We pray for Travis Williams as he is in the hospital. We pray, Father, that as he is on a ventilator, as he is battling COVID-19, we pray, Father, that every treatment possible will work and that soon, Father, soon he will be able to come off that ventilator and he will be able to return to his normal health that he had. We pray, Father, throughout the world for all of those that are suffering from COVID-19. Father, we thought this would be over by now, but it's still continuing. And we pray, Father, for all of those that are suffering with it, all of those that have suffered from it, and all of those that will in the future suffer from it. We pray, Father, that one day very soon we will look back and see that this is no longer a regular, everyday concern. We pray, Father, for... For Bonnie Wade, as she is at home, we pray as she has shingles, uh, she will be able to recover quickly and that, that will be a uh, painless recovery for her. We pray, Father, for Mary Cecil Cordell and the passing of her sister. We pray, Father, for encouragement for her. We know, Father, that that is always a difficult and very dark time of our lives when we lose loved ones. And we pray, Father, we'll be a part of that encouragement to others. We pray, Father, a very special prayer this morning on the revival in America that starts tonight. We pray, Father, we will avail ourselves to be there, not only tonight, but also throughout the week as this continues. And we pray, Father, as we meet for our regular midweek service, as we've changed that to Thursday, we pray, Father, we'll put that into our calendar and we'll make sure that we always put a study of your word at an appropriate amount of time in our lives. We pray, Father, that as we're here today, we'll be thankful. And as we leave this place, as we return back this evening, that we will be safe, but we pray, Father, we'll be encouraged. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to take a look this morning at unity. I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This will help us pick up our study this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. You know what's interesting about these short little chapters or short little books, let me correct that, short little books, as you end 2 Corinthians, you have just left a, a lengthy discussion, a, a, a two-letter, um, and both of them are rather long. You know, 2 Corinthians ends with a chapter that is chapter 13, and, and it's full of weighty matters, difficult things. And you think about 1 Corinthians, and you think about how maybe even 1 Corinthians was more difficult. What do you think the most difficult thing is in 1 Corinthians? You ever thought about that? In every book, there's something that's difficult. There's something that seems to be the height. In First and Second Corinthians, especially thinking about First Corinthians, what's the most difficult thing they had to hear? Well, they weren't doing right. It almost seems as you read First Corinthians over and over and over again, Paul is moving from this subject to this subject to this subject, correcting the things that, listen to this, people just like you and just like me were doing. So you leave these kind of large letters and you kind of transition as you walk through the New Testament into these smaller letters. And, and Galatians is a, is a wonderful, wonderful book that teaches us about the, the concepts of what Paul has done, the concepts about what the Galatians have done in turning to the gospel. And, and, and chapter 3 is an interesting chapter to me because it starts out this way in chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. You ever wondered if... The Apostle Paul were alive, and he wrote a letter to Pulaski. What would he write? 
What would he write? Well, probably something just like he wrote to First and Second Corinthians, the Corinthian folks. Probably something just like he wrote to those in Galatia. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Maybe he would write to us and say, I don't even know where to start with you. But these letters are all written for a purpose. You, you move over into the book of Ephesians. And, and you see chapter 1. Chapter 1 is kind of that introductory chapter, this, this exaltation, this building up of Christ and who he is and, and what he has done. And, and verse 16 the idea of how you and I, and Paul says, well, we're going to make sure we pray for one another. We're always going to mention one another in our prayers. Why? Because prayer is powerful. And he talks about these principalities and powers and dominions, verse 21, and how verse 22 and 23, everything is under the authority of Christ. In chapter 2, this is an important chapter. You, he writes to them, and you he hath quickened. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now look at verse 2. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power, the air, the spirit, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who did you used to follow? If you didn't follow God, who did you follow? Boy, that's difficult. So he writes these letters to all of these people, and there's something I want to point out to you. Every letter that was written to a group of people or to an individual involved problems. Now, anybody in here ever had problems? We've all had physical problems, haven't we? Maybe in the last two years, 19 months maybe, we've, we've seen the heightenment of physical problems, haven't we? There have been things in times past of which generations have faced that were physical in nature and physical problems existed. But in our lifetimes, this is the major event that we've seen in the health science industry. We've seen physical problems. Anybody in this room ever had... We don't even want to say it, do we? Spiritual problems. You know what we say when we say spiritual problems? Has anybody in this room ever been in sin? And thus, we are just like all of the people, all of the people that were written to in the New Testament. And Paul tells them as he walks them through these small letters, they're, they're probably my favorite study, what they have to do. He says, verse 1 of chapter 4, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. You know, that's not appealing language to us, is it? Because how many in this room want to be prisoners? We don't want that. We, we don't want to be in captivity. We, we don't want to be in endangerment. We don't want to be harassed. We don't want to be persecuted. But Paul says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. Remember what Jesus said about you and I, about his people? Do you remember? We'll be persecuted for whose name's sake? They hate you because they hate me, Jesus said. And Paul reiterates that theme. I'm the prisoner of the Lord. And he gives this idea of what's happening. I want you to look with me at verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians 4. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a study down through verses 4 through 6 for just a moment to see the unity that people can have inside of Christ. So we're going to look at seven pillars. Just look at verses 1 through 3 with me. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace. What is unity? Togetherness. Togetherness. I agree. Any other definitions? One, one, one purpose. I think of the word whole. Whole. If we are in unity, we are whole. Any other definitions of the word unity? We don't think of, how many times have you thought about unity in the last seven days? Got some glared over looks on that one. We, we, don't, we don't naturally think about this very often, do we? We just don't. 
We do think about it when there's a problem. You're right. You're right. What are problems? <laughs> Set you up for a question on that, didn't I? What are, what, are pro- what are real, true problems? We don't think about that very often either, do we? We think about it when we face them. I, I believe problems can be divided in two different areas. We've already kind of talked about physical problems. I don't want to talk about physical problems today because I really can't help you in that area, in all the areas. But spiritual problems. You ever been in problems spiritually? We've already answered that. We we have. And that's usually when we think about this idea of what's taking place. Now, I want you to see something, and it's important. I want you to see a word, and I'm going to say it is the key word that's going to help us unpack and understand what's happening in verses 4 through 6. If you look in verse 1, find the key word. Now, I'll help you. It is very small. I. I. If you and I are going to be united together, where does it start? I have to. And you have to say, I have to. I love Paul start, starting with this. I therefore am the prisoner of the Lord. And what's he doing? He's beseeching, he's begging. I love this word beseech. When it is used, it is used in a tender language. It's used in this way of inviting someone in your home to tell them the most important thing that ever could be told. And here's Paul who's writing to who? Who's, who's Paul writing to? Or the people at Ephesus, but who are they? The church. He says, I've got the most important thing to tell you. I I want to tell you this. That you. He he said, you. I want you to see, verse 1, the personal nature of unity. Now let's kind of define what it's going to be as we see it in verses 4 through 6. Let's see the seven pillars, and then we'll break them down and make them in a way we can see them and remember them. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Do you see, verse 6, the personal nature of unity? And in what? You, now listen to this, all. Do you know what happens when unity is destroyed? One of us, multiple of us, gave up. That's how unity is destroyed. How many people does it take to destroy unity? One. How easy is it for one to destroy unity? Real easy, isn't it? You can destroy unity in your words, can't you? You can. You can destroy unity in your actions, can't you? You can destroy unity in the lack of your actions, can't you? And you can even destroy unity with the lack of your presence. So let's start off by looking at this, and let's see these seven different pillars that will help us build unity as we press forward. We're going to look at them in an interesting way. Number one, let's look at the one body. And let's see unity of organization, one spirit, unity of revelation, one hope, unity of direction, one Lord, unity of authority, one faith, unity of doctrine, one baptism, unity of entrance, And one God will end with unity of worship. Let's think about the first one in chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body. Let's think about unity of organization. I want you to think about Romans chapter 12. Specifically, I want you to go to Romans chapter 12 and look at verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Something interesting happens as this particular uh, chapter starts off. Chapter Chapter 12, 1 and 2. Our personal passages, once again, who's writing the book of Romans? All right, we're, we're, we're back with Paul. And Paul says, I beseech you therefore. This is a personal passage. He tells us who it is. It's brethren. 
And what he says is we've got to be people who are sacrifices. Chapter verse 2, we've got to be transformed. But read down to verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one member of another. There is unity, folks, in the church. That's the body that's being described in Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body. There is one church. Now, I want to think about it in three different ways because this is probably the three different ways that we think about it in our minds in being united in the body. We think about it, number one, in the setting that we're in right now, congregationally. Congregationally, we think about unity in the body. Should there be unity among God's people that meet at a certain place? Well, yeah, there should be. How do you have that? We're going to ask this question seven times. How do you have that? How do you have unity in the body? I'm going to give you the same answer seven times this morning. I've got to do something. And you have to say, I've got to do something. You know how you have unity? You do something. If you and I are all following the same body, or it's following the same word, and we're all in the same body, what's going to happen to us? We're going to have unity. I love this illustration in chapter 12, verse 4 and 5 of Romans. There are many members in the body. Not all are called to the same office. Are we all the same Would it be good if we were all exactly the same? What if we were a congregation of 200 preachers, 200 elders, 200 deacons, 200 members? What, 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 would, that, what would that do? Confusion. I do believe that Paul wrote, let all things be done decently. Remember the rest of it? And in order. In other words, there, there's a design to the church. There, there's something put together in all of this. And there is unity in organization, and that has to do with us. It has to do with John 17, verse 21, something that Jesus was doing in his prayer. Jesus was promoting the very idea of unity to you and I and to the disciples of his time. When he was praying there in John 17, he was praying that they would all be one. And he uses an illustration he says, as thou, Father, this is the Son speaking to the Father, you are in me, we are united together, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's important, because unity has to do with the way people see God. So we think about it congregation. Let's think about it locally locally you know the way we kind of see the church sometimes is only locally okay and that, that's 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 nothing to do with us uh, very few of us have traveled um, extensively around the world so we, we just don't see that in our daily organization so we think about the church locally you can think about the other congregations this morning that are already meeting should we be united together should we all be organized the same way? Now, what I'm not saying is we should all follow the pattern of worship that one follows. We should not all do two songs, one prayer, Lord's Supper, sermon. That's not what I'm saying. But we should all worship in the same mindset, shouldn't we? We should all be structured in the same way. Go read First and Second Timothy and, and learn about structure. Is there structure in the church? There is. Why do we know there's structure in the church? Because we were organized in a proper fashion. We were arranged by God to be one in him, to be one with another. So we think about ourselves locally. Then we've got to think about it in a third way. The church has got to be unified in organization globally. You know, there are people on the other side of the world that you've never met. You ever thought about that? You've never met them. And most likely... You never will. That's nothing against you, me, or them. Most likely, you never will. If you ever ran into them, most likely they would speak a different language and you would have a barrier that you could not overcome. But should the church be united around the world? 
Go read the book of Acts. Go read the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians. Did they not take up collections to help other people in other parts of the world? The church can be unified in organization. How are we organized becomes the question. Through the word. That will be our answer as we go through. So there is one body. There's one spirit. The word spirit makes us panic a little bit, doesn't it? We think about this, these two words, Holy Spirit or King James, Holy Ghost. And those two phrases just make us timid. But let me tell you this, there's nothing about the Holy Spirit you should be timid about. Number one, without the Holy Spirit, the Word of God would be incomplete. Think about that for just a minute. That's, that's John 17, or John 14, 26, we're going to see that in just a minute. Without the Holy Spirit, the Word of God would be incomplete. Without the Holy Spirit, your prayers would be incomplete. We, 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 know, we know enough about the Holy Spirit. Now, are there things we'd like to know? Of course. There's things we always would like to know, but we know what we need when it comes to the Spirit of God. And here's what I know about the one Spirit. We must be united in revelation. Now, this might be, in my opinion, this is Jonathan's opinion, don't listen to it. This might be one of the most important for us today. If there's anything we need to be doing today, we need to be united in word. United in word, in our teachings. In our teachings. That's extremely important. I want you to think about Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners. Now pause with me there. We don't use the word sundry very often, do we? And it's not very often we use the word diverse in many different times and in many different ways. God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Now pause with me. The fathers, who were the fathers? There you go. Now if you, if you, if you take a modern literal view of this passage, you'll think, well, I'm a father. Was that who he spoke to? Well, you've got to have an understanding of the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews is the Old Testament, New Testament book. And you, you, you need to know something about the Old Testament to, to know something about the book of Hebrews. There was a time when God spoke to the chosen men of which he chose, those who led the generations of people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a great illustration of those men. And, and in different times he spoke to them. And through different men he spoke to the world. Go, go read the Old Testament and you will see over and over and over different individuals of which the Lord worked through. That's who we're talking about. Now, what we're going to learn in this particular scene when we go to this next word, hath in these last days, we're going to have to learn something. We're going to have to learn that there were a varying groups of days. Go back and look at the different ages as defined in the Old Testament and even in through the New Testament and even in the age that we live in now, what age are we living in now? The age of Christ or the Christian age. That's what's happening. This was what it was all about. Matter of fact, you start the book of Genesis, everything's perfect, everything's great, everything's good in chapter 2. What happens in chapter 3? I'm going to define it for you before you give the answer. We messed it up. Okay, if it wasn't Adam and Eve, it would have been Jonathan and Kelly. It would have been you two as well. One of us would have messed it up. Everything was great to chapter 2. And from chapter 3 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, what's it about? Jesus who's coming. That was the purpose. That was the point. And through all of this, there were varying ways that God spoke to people. And in this particular scene, he's spoken unto his son, in these last days, it is Jesus of whom you and I listen to. That's why we're going to look at John 14 again in just a moment. But we read these words as we finish the passage. Whom he hath appointed, heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Number one, here's what I want you to see. The last part of verse two. The one that we follow, the one of which we listen to, it's Jesus. He also did what? Made the worlds you know when we look at people in this age in this time and in, in our lives we want to know credentials don't we when you go to the doctor you want to know where they went to the doctor don't you you, you want to know what their certifications are don't you I, i'll be honest i don't want a dentist 
working on my bones. I, I don't want a foot doctor working in my eye. I don't want a heart doctor working in my brain. Sometimes I wonder if he could find it. That on me, not on him. <laughs> we understand that, don't we? And that, that goes into a number of different areas, all sorts of areas in the financial sector. We want to work with people who know what they're doing. They have the credentials to do the job. Even in many other areas, we, we, we look at that. When you look for a mechanic or even someone to work on something with your home, I recently had to find a drywall person because I made a, would you believe this, I made a huge mess. And so finally I went and found somebody that could fix it. He's going to fix it today. Well, I wanted someone who could do the job because he has the credentials behind it. Same thing with your automobiles. And it, it, when you need some repair done, you look for someone who has the credentials to do it. Jesus has the credentials to do it. It will be said of no one else outside of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that they made the worlds. It was Jesus who was the literal builder of the worlds. That's the one we listen to. Because he has the credentials. That's why unity of spirit, unity of revelation is so important. Thus I take your minds to John 14 verse 26. This is to me, at least in my opinion, the greatest passage you need to know about the Holy Spirit. Not number one, because it helps direct our mind to what the Holy Spirit does. But number two, it gives us authority behind the Spirit. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So we could call the Holy Spirit the Comforter, which by the way... How important is that? What, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? To comfort. To comfort. Just think about that for just a moment. To comfort. And we read these particular phrases. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Ah, unity of revelation. The things that Jesus said, he said the Holy Spirit's going to come and tell you. And these people that were being the beneficiaries of the statement that Jesus made, guess what they did? Unity of revelation. So what do you and I need to have? Unity of revelation. So here's the question. How, how do we have unity of revelation? How do we have unity in the spirit? I've got to do something, don't I? You, you, you've got to do something to make this applicable, to make this Something that will work for you and I. So we see unity in Revelation. Let's see the one hope. Following Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. One hope, unity of direction. We go ourselves to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we look at verses 24 and 25. Romans 8, 24 and 25. It reads this way. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man see, why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You know what I would really like to have? I hope I have. I'm going to use this word inappropriately for just a minute. You know what I'd, I'd hope to have today? A bottle of water. You know I'm using it inappropriately? I'm not hoping for that, am I? I've already got it. Matter of fact, it takes me very little, very little To get what I already have. I hoped for it. No, I didn't. I wanted it. I wanted it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I almost <clears throat> choked and coughed when I drunk it. Boy, that would have been bad. <laughs> Did I hope for that? No. Unity of direction. We're saved by hope, but you need to know what hope and what direction you have been saved by. You are hoping for something you've never seen. Matter of fact, I think this, think about this in two different ways. Number one, you hope to see Jesus. Anybody else hope to see Jesus? Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen him? No. I've read about him. And in, in a way, I guess I could say I've seen him because I've seen his actions. I, I've read from him the words that he has said. And in, in a way, I guess I could say I've heard him. 
And that's true. But have you ever stood face to face with him? That's right. That's really what it is, unity of expectation. Because we know where we're going. If we are God's people, if you are a Christian, where will you be? Where will you be? You'll be in heaven. No one who is a Christian will be in hell. Listen to that statement. No one who is a Christian will be lost. Because a Christian lives the life of Christ. Now there are many times when we don't live the life of Christ. Isn't that true? We've got to come back home. And I know we can get into an intricate conversation about repentance and all of that, but that's not the point of our idea here. It's unity, and you're right. Unity of expectation is a better idea of this hope. We have this hope, and it's something that we've not seen. And we use, oh, listen to this word, last part of verse 25. We have patience. How many of you have patience? You ever prayed for patience? Give that a try. Many times we have the patience of a three-year-old. Anybody ever dealt with a three-year-old recently? Not much patience. Let me ask you a separate question. Anybody dealt with a Christian lately? Sometimes there's not much patience. We have everything to hope for. We, we know where we're going. We have the same hope. Matter of fact, all Christians everywhere have this same hope. But I want you to see something about this. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abideth faith, hope, and love, charity. But the greatest of these is what? Hope. Faith. Put it into perspective. We know where we're going. Do we love, enough, love people enough to tell them? Whether that be those that are sitting right beside us this morning in the same room or whether it be those that are out in our community and even into our world. We have a direction of which we are following. We also have one Lord as we continue on in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, one Lord. This is unity of authority. We won't spend much time on this because I think it's the simplest of them all. Uh, Jesus came and saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Who has authority? Jesus. Now, I want to illustrate four different areas Five different areas of people that don't have authority. Our world does not have authority over everything. That's true, isn't it? Remember what they said in the book of Acts? We ought to obey God rather than men. The world does not have all authority. You know who else doesn't have authority? All authority? Preachers. Preachers don't have all authority. you believe that? I hope you do. Because where do preachers get their message? Preachers are copy and paste. We use a modern term of it. We copy, we paste. That's all we do. That's all we can do. The idea of heralding. You can't change the message. You know who else doesn't have authority? All authority? Elders. Now, does our world have authority? Yes. A preacher? Yes. Do the elders have authority? Yes, but they don't have all authority. Where do elders work? Within the word. Within the expediencies. You know who else doesn't have authority? Deacons. Not all authority. You know who else has, doesn't have authority? Members. Not all authority. So who has all authority? Christ. All power, all authority is given unto me in what? Heaven and in earth. The idea of Hebrews chapter 5, 8, and 9. The very ending of this passage says, Obey what? Him. He is the one that has the authority. We are united together in authority based on this one Lord. We're united together in faith, unity of doctrine, what we teach. It was written in Jude chapter 1. It's only one chapter book, but Jude 1, 3. When I gave, or beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful to me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The 
faith, the doctrine, the teaching. There's nothing else. There is nothing else. Now, here's our biggest problem in one faith, unity of doctrine. What we like to do is we like to interpret things. We like to read into things experience. Our experience. Our understandings. Our livelihoods. When in turn, we should be reading this into our experiences. We should be reading this into our livelihoods. We should be living this into our lives. That's the difficult part of it. Don't be a proof texter. Don't find a Bible text to prove your point. It will fail. It may not fail right away, but it will. We should find Bible texts to prove our lives, not our points. And thus we understand from Jude 1-3 that the faith was delivered. That means it was sealed, it was set. By the way, who did the faith come from, John 14-26? The Savior. That's that's where all doctrine comes from. That's where all teachings come from. There's nowhere else to go. It's Acts 4-32 that reads this way, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither was any of them that ought or that ought of the things which he had possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. All things in common. Boy, that's interesting to me. And all the things that they did and all the things that they believed in singleness of one heart, one soul, it was as if all the Christians were right on the same page. And that's where we've got to get. Now, Are there ever any times where we might disagree about a Bible subject? Okay, let's move on. (laughs) All right, let me ask you a question. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Many people believe it's his eyesight. Some people believe it was... Uh, an ailment of his body due to the beatings and things that he had been through. Some people believe that it was the treatment that his own people turned against him. Some people believed it was the treatment of Rome being in prison for so long. So which one was it? Oh, there's a good one. I forgot that one. That's right. Could have been his guilty conscience. You ever done something wrong and knew it? Made it right but still felt bad about it? Uh. I imagine Paul understood that. So which one is it? It's not doctrine, folks. That's not doctrine. That is not doctrine. Understand what it is. Let's get our last two, and we're going to have to really, let's, let's get moving. We've got three minutes. Here we go. One baptism, unity of entrance. It's in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27, that talks about putting on Christ. How do you put on Christ? In baptism. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27 is your go-to baptism passage. You need to know that passage. Remember that passage. Because if one puts on Christ, how does he do it? For as many of you as have been baptized, immersed. That's the word, baptized, immersed. Have put on Christ. Boy, that's important. Same thing in 1 Peter 3, 21. It's not a washing of the body. You know, the body from time to time needs to be washed. I think think we all understand that, don't we? But that's not what baptism is. Baptism is not washing away, I love the text, the filth of the flesh. That happens and it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be handled. But it's about something so much more. When we think about unity, it's unity of entrance. Let's think about the one God. This is the final thing. When we think about God, we think about unity of worship, our reverence. Maybe we should entitle it this way, unity of reverence. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? You must reverence God, for he is worthy. That's what this is about. Then we reference Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 through 9. The people there, and it was Jesus who understood this. 
they drew nigh to him with their mouths. You ever seen somebody who was two-faced? This is the definition. They draw nigh to me with their mouths. Oh, we love Jesus. Jesus is the best. We live for Jesus. But when he was gone, they never breathed his name. That probably, folks, should be one of our biggest concerns. Today we breathe his name. Matter of fact, this week, September 5th through the 9th, we have five opportunities to breathe his name. What will you do with the other two days? It's just something to think about. We have unity together, unity of reverence or unity of worship. And all of these things pull us together. All of these things are seven pillars that affect every area of our lives. And thus, this morning we have something we can work on, something we can work with, something that we can do. And hopefully that will be beneficial to you. I appreciate your attention and comments in class this morning. And we look forward to our worship period here in just a few moments.